Hello everyone and welcome on board the biggest live safari on the planet. The only live safari on the planet actually. And it's a great pleasure to have you with us. My name is Scott if you are joining for the first time and I'm teamed up with Viam on camera. James is also headed out with Dave and his plans are, go to, are to go to the hyena den which was visited by the Inkahuma pride of Lioness last night. So he's interested to see what the status is going to be of things there. The lions didn't cause any harm to the, the hyena. The adults just ran off and the cubs went deep down into the holes. But he'll tell you more about what happened. He was there when it did happen. That's his plans. And my plans are to at least try to try and find these ladies. The Inkahuma lioness, the same lions that visited the den. Now, Brent also heard these lions last night, and he seems to think that they were chasing buffalo uh, somewhere around our northern boundary. He heard buffalo letting off snorts, he heard thundering hooves, and he guesses that those lions were giving the buffalo a hard time. So who knows, maybe the Inkahuma pride were successful in catching one. Only time will tell. Well, if any of you are joining for the first time, I mentioned that this is a live safari. It's not only live, but it's also interactive. We'd love to hear from you. And what we'd like to hear is how happy you are that we found lions already. So you can let us know out of 10 how happy you are, because there they are. Cha-ching! And to do that, you can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I'm not going to use the torch, actually. It's going to be better just to use the natural light. Um, is to use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, as I was saying, or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. So let us know how you're feeling. What a great start. And aren't we lucky? These lions are, interestingly enough, very close to the hyena den. We're just on Mvubu Road at the junction of the Gallagher waterhole. So James should be coming past us at any moment on his way to the hyena den, which is just further up this road. We turned right at the T-junction, and he is going to be turning left and driving about a quarter of a mile to get to the hyena den. Now, I'm just wondering, these lions look like they could be watching something. Oh, let me re recalculate my route here. They could still be chasing the same buffalo that they've been chasing all night that Brent heard. So I just want to kind of loop ahead and, and, and drive in the direction they're looking initially before making our way back to them. That way at least we know what they're looking at. In this thick bush it can be difficult to tell. Well, good prospects. It's a cloudy morning. So... The temperature is in our favor and also in the lion's favor. They prefer cooler weather. It's about 24 degrees Celsius and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't seem to see anything up here. So let's just wiggle our way in through the bush and get you some closer views of them. And negative James, we're about 100 meters north of the junction of the Waterhole and the Mvubu Boulevard. Yep. James was just being very courteous there and asking whether or not he's going to interfere in any way, if he needs to take a different route to the hyena den, but he's not in any way, so I told him to just make his way straight through. And thank you very much for everyone who's congratulating me, including Viam, who was impressed with my spot. I got lucky using the, the, the spotlight. It's quite easy to pick up the reflection of animals' eyes. Well, incredibly easy. They glisten back like bright lights. And that's what attracted me to these lioness. Good morning, ladies. You guys are looking a little bit tired. Have the buffaloes been giving you a hard time? Mm-hmm, it looks like it. 
Some of you are lying very sheepishly, not even looking at us. I just want to try and find a good spot to stop, and I think it's going to just take a moment or two that we can see as many of them as possible. But maybe I'll just stop at this little gap here. That's to start with. Hello, girls. Hey. Why are you looking so sheepish? Is there something you're ashamed of? Is there something that we need to hear from you? Hmm. Hot. Uh, it would be wonderful to know exactly what they got up to last night. What's interesting is that I'm hugely surprised to find them here because we were in this very, very kind of same area, basically, last night when we saw them heading north, away from where we are. And I really didn't expect them to be this close to the point where we left them. But that is the beauty of being on safari. You just never know what these animals are going to do. And that's what causes us to often be very pleasantly surprised. Now, even though they are sleeping now, I have got a feeling that they're going to get up at some point and I don't know what's ca causing me to think that maybe it's just the body language of uh, the few of them that do have their heads up now. Oh, Vim, if you don't mind just panning out there, there's, they're all kind of slowly popping their heads up. Some are looking towards us. The two on the right were looking away from us. They seem to have heard something down there. Their ears have really pricked up facing in that direction. Also, lots of yawning which is a very good sign to see big cats performing, often an indicator that they are about to do something. Oh, yes, that's looking good. Yeah, this is looking very, very promising. Big yawns, stretches, this one's getting up, and wouldn't it be wonderful if they coincided their roughly four hours of movement? They move four to six hours a day on average. That's what research suggests. The other 18 to 20 hours is spent sleeping. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could coincide our safari times with their moments of movement? Which is looking basically like it's spot on this morning. As we've started our safari, it looks like they too are about to start at least one bout of movement. Uh oh, are you guys going to start getting playful? I think there's a little bit of a playful streak about to come through here, yeah? which is one of my favorite things to watch. Oh, yes, ladies. Can you hear what we've been saying, or is it just uncanny timing? I think it's uncanny timing. They definitely can't hear what we say. If anybody does feel they have the ability to speak to these animals, please let us know because we would employ you in a heartbeat. And I'm guessing they've just had a little breather, regrouping, and now look to be possibly on the hunt, on the prowl. Linda, don't worry. The girls are not going after the hyenas, so at least at this point in time, they are heading directly away from the hyena den. They're heading in a northerly direction, so nothing to worry about there. And as, uh, as a lot of you would have seen yesterday on the sunset safari, uh, the hyena managed to escape very easily from the leopard, uh, the lion, apologies. And of course, that's not going to be the case every time, but those youngsters do stay very close to the, the burrows, and even if they're not very close, they can shuffle those little legs of theirs quite quickly, and they know when there's any sign of danger exactly where those holes are, and they tend to barrel down them very quickly. Come on, you two. Okay, well, we're going to try and loop ahead of the rest of the pride. These two, I'm sure, are going to get up at any moment. And because it is quite thick, it may take a few moments. So the perfect opportunity to send you across to James, who has just arrived at the hyena den. 
great relief. Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful here to be at the hyena den with uh, the cubs. They're all still here. There are a few adults here. The lions, of course, in case you missed it, on the sunset safari last night, came wandering through here. We had a lioness sitting right where this little cub has come from, sticking her nose into the hole. The cubs were totally silent inside. The adults ran away. They've obviously decided things are safe. Uh, the lions are not too far from here right now, but it's just marvelous that everything is okay here with my favorite part of the reserve. Good morning, like I say. My name is James Hendry. On camera, we've got Sleepy Dave this morning. How are you doing, Dave? Morning, James. There we go. And with us, of course, the hyenas. You're on a live safari, as Scott has told you. Talk to us, please. Hashtag Safari Live. We're very unusual bird sighting today. So if you wish to tweet like the mocking cliff chat we saw in camp today, hashtag Safari Live. Otherwise, get hold of us on the email, questions at wildearth.tv. Alternatively, I believe the YouTube chat thing works as well. It's all beyond me, I'm afraid. Social media is a mystery more confusing than the Nazca lines. Now, what we've got here is the two D cubs, December cubs. There's one of them there. That's her there. And then the other one coming into frame now. I think that's their mum. Is that Corky? I don't know that that is Corky. I can't see the top of her head. It could well be. Then to the right of that, we've got, I think, June. Looks like June. Here comes November now. To the left there, Dave. There's June coming, not June, November coming through. And the two little black cubs are obviously still in bed at the moment. They're down in the den. The daughters of the matriarch, Madam, so named by Jamie. Marvellous. In fact, that's pretty on the ground there, I think. And Wicked Ange, I'm absolutely shared your concerns. You were worried that during the night the lions would come back and manage to get hold of one of these little cubs. And that has not been the case. Now, I read something very interesting. I didn't read it. Steph told me something very interesting about some of the stuff he's been reading about hyenas. Apparently, what can happen is that if lions move into and start concentrating in an area around a den, it's not unusual for the adults to abandon the den entirely and leave the cubs to themselves and they die inside the den. And that clearly has not happened here. And I'm very pleased that it hasn't. But what you did see last night was as that lioness popped up over there and she came in towards the den, the adults scarpered. They didn't try and defend the den at all. The youngsters then disappeared inside and they were kept completely safe by the special shelf that they dig for themselves and underneath the ground there. But if the lions continue to exert pressure in this area, it's possible that the adults might abandon the den. I don't think that's going to happen. I really don't. Look at this little thing so close to us now. OK, I don't think these hyenas are going to go anywhere. They'll continue playing, so we'll sit here. And while we do that, let's follow the lions with Scott. So we've managed to loop ahead here. And this is Amber Eye. She's evidently taking control and is often the one leading the pride's movement. So that's hasn't always been the case. She's looking very, very focused. The other four seem to be in a long trail spread out behind us. They're not evidently as motivated as she is this morning. I can't see any of them yet, but I'm sure they are going to be following along a very similar pathway that she moved along. I think she can hear something up here, it's some possible prey. She's moving. Thanks, Vim. I'm surprised that none of them are coming yet, but I'm glad we did have a look there. Her body language is definitely indicating that she can hear something, possibly smell something. Time will tell. And Natasha in Ontario, you'd like to know how often lions eat. Well, their last meal that we know of was not yesterday evening, but the evening before, where they managed to catch a zebra fall that they shared amongst one another. And that's uh, lasted them sufficiently until now. 
Isn't it incredible how she disappears? I know the bush is quite thick here, but she's only about 15 meters away from us, yet she conceals herself very well at this time of the year. Her coat is camouflaging perfectly with the dry vegetation. Sorry, Natasha. So now their bellies are not looking full as they were kind of yesterday. And they could do with the meal today, and that's why we're seeing them actively on the move. It's not to say that they need to eat today in order to survive. They will easily be able to survive probably another two or three days comfortably before having another meal. So from having a full belly, basically they can go for five days comfortably without a meal. And probably even two weeks would probably be their maximum period of time without anything to, to feed on. But because it is very difficult for them to catch their prey, it can be sheer luck that every day for a week they may catch something small to eat or they might catch something big like a buffalo that will last them a week. There's so many variables. Here come the rest of the ladies. And it looks like I think Amber Eyes is going to come back and try and jump on them. She's moving quite quickly from left to right, back down towards them. And let's hope that they perform in a little gap. She's probably going to run and jump and pounce on one. Oh, no, I just heard an impala alarm call. Take the, take our sisters there. They're chasing something. OK. Now, the lions are, are chasing something. There were some impala alarm calls up to our left. I think that's who Amber Oz was initially interested in. One lioness is still right here. So there was a bit of a chase. VM saw some running. I've sadly now heard these impala alarm calling. And without the elements of surprise, it can be very difficult for predators to catch their prey. <laughs> Hello, ex Ranga has just sent in the, the lion whispering kind of CV for us to check out, and it goes raw, raw, raw. Now, please, gonna have our job. <laughs> As we off-road, this monkey orange that we drive over is just going to pop back up. It's a very hardy species, so do not fear. We are not causing massive damage to the ecosystem, despite the fact that it may sound like that. Probably going to be a moment or two before we, we get to the Next good view, so we're going to send you over to James now. Hello, everybody. Sorry, you're just finally uh, getting off the dashboard. I was in the way of the sighting there. Um, still here. Everything's going beautifully. The hyenas are playing and enjoying themselves. Two of them have disappeared around the corner with the adult, and the others are just here. I don't know where the really little ones are. I'm sure they're probably inside the den. Which piece of the den, I don't know. What I just want to try and do is identify the female lying at the top. With my powerful binoculars, last used by Genghis Khan during an extended campaign across the Russian steppe. I don't know who that is. Hmm. Now, interestingly, you want to know, Rame, obviously we're going to talk quite a lot about yesterday's incident of the lions arriving here. And Rame, you want to know if these cubs would have smelt or heard the lioness fossicking about in or smelling about into the hole. Definitely they would have. They would have smelt the lioness, they would have seen the lioness's um, sort of uh, terrifying features darkening the hole as she stuck her nose inside there. And she, they absolutely would have heard them as well. And they would have stayed dead still and dead quiet in the back. And that's precisely what they did. And that is precisely why they are here to, well, 
fight another day, as it were, although they're not fighting at all, they're having a grand old time. I'm so impressed by hyenas, I must say. Here comes little June, I think. And her mother, the scar-backed female I haven't seen for a long time. And I'm, I guess it does mean that she's coming back to the den. Well, certainly she must have been until about ooh, maybe a month and a half ago to suckle this youngster. And then she's obviously going out foraging, not spending time at the den. And I suspect it's because she is Excuse me one second, I lift my phone on there, that's disgusting behaviour. I suspect that is because she is a low-ranking female. And low-ranking females will come back to the den briefly, suckle and then disappear again. Isn't this wonderful? Now I made mention at the beginning of our little drive that we had a mocking cliff chat in camp today. Now, I know that's completely meaningless to most of you, but to those of you who are ornithologists and trying to keep a list, that is a bird, I guarantee you, that is not on your list. And if it is, um, I'd be fascinated to know how on earth you found it there. But what is interesting to me is that, again, the dawn chorus today is subdued and quiet. The drought is bringing in uh, apart from the fact that there's obviously great quiet during the mornings, I do find it fascinating that it's now starting to bring in unusual birds. We had a bearded robin in camp the other day. That's not that unusual for this area, but I haven't seen one yet. And But that mocking cliff chat was bizarre. Here we sit in the morning. It's almost silent. There are one or two Franklins calling. That's about it. It feels like the orchestra is on strike, but for one or two hardened members, it's exactly what's going on here. Well, now, Donna, you're in South Carolina and you missed yesterday's sunset safari. Of course, I must ask the question, Mr. Donna, what on earth could possibly have been more important than that? Um, of course, being facetious. And you say you heard that the lions scent marked at the den and how would that affect the hyenas? Donna, they did. I certainly wondered. The amber-eyed female of the Infohuma pride came wandering up here, sniffed in the hole that David is currently focused on. Then she walked down and she started to scent mark around the place. And you want to know what effect that's going to have on the hyenas. Donna, clearly no effect at all. They obviously don't care. One jot. Scott and I both thought maybe they might move the den now, but clearly they haven't. Unless, and I don't know, I mean, I haven't looked around here, unless Madam has taken her little buns and moved them to another den site, which is possible. I don't, I don't think that's Madam. see on top there. David, you can just focus in on the ears of that adult there. And Majikle, you wanted that. Maybe that is Madam. In fact, look at her scaffy ears and she doesn't have the scarring on the top of her head. So I think that's Madam there. Majikle, you wanted to know if they were going to... Uh, let me just say that again. Majikle. I'm not sure. That's a fascinating name. You wanted to know if they were going to move the den or not. And clearly not yet. And it was getting very niffy here yesterday. It's getting particularly smelly. But despite that, the hyenas have not moved to the den. There's a Franklin calling. Look at those little things looking over there. Oh dear, Mike in Florida, I don't know. You say if I had to pick one member of this clan as my favorite, which one would it be? Hmm. 
Mike, I... I mean, obviously, D1, with her little white sock on her hind left foot, is uh, very characteristic. But... I, so instinct says to me, the, the second D, D uh, twin, so D2, the little male, uh, maybe it would be him that I would uh, choose if I had to pick one as my favourite. I'm not really sure why I say that. I enjoy them all a huge amount. Back the lions have just come across some Inyala. It's a bit of chaos and confusion here. The line of bombshell in every direction after the Inyala. This is one of them. But it looks like... As so often happens, the prey have evaded the predator. So exciting stuff that all of a sudden just poof, unfolded in Yala. We're running everywhere, lion, we're running everywhere. We were actually quite far away from the lion, trying to loop ahead of them through a very, very thick block. And it worked out in our favor. They came chasing in Yala straight past us. And You didn't miss out on anything, so fear not. And now we're going to try to have to find these lions again, which is not going to be very... We'll not find them again, but just keep with them after they've bobbershelled. I think the one individual is heading back in the direction of the rest of the pride. They were all off to our left here. Oh, there's an Anyala bark that you heard, Pah! almost like the bark of a dog. And I hope Kathy's joining us because she joined for the first time yesterday, thanks to Deb, who invited her. And she was interested to know about alarm calls. She on the left, Jeff, there we've got. Oh. So there's still a chance. I mean, this line have scattered the herd of Inyala. And I guess that's why this one individual line kept running past us there. This, even though they've lost their elements of the surprise, I guess, like I said, because they have bombshelled the Inyala, they could still get lucky. For us, I think we're just going to sit tight. We don't want to interfere in any way. And by moving the vehicle, we're either going to disadvantage the lion, who cannot cheer the Inyala, or vice versa, disadvantage the Inyala, because they cannot cheer the lion approaching. So we don't want to do that. Of course, you do want to try and stay with these animals, and it looks like this one lioness is heading back towards us. Now, I know James is enjoying some good sightings at the Hyena Den, and that's absolutely perfect. I don't suggest that you come here and join us in this thick bush. driving with this VR rig on the front of the vehicle. I fear that, obviously, that it's going to break at any point in time. Look at all these aardvark excavations. This is fascinating. Yeah. I'm actually going to leave it on, Vim, in case they come running past us again, buddy. Um, there goes one line. It's playing. Oh, wow, look at that. I didn't even see the other one until it erupted from behind the cover. That was so cool. Well done, Vim, for capturing that. And I think the ladies in Final Control are already going to get together a slow motion clip so you can watch that happen unfold with a little bit more time on your hands. So that's some, an exciting prospect to look forward to. I can hear an Impala alarm calling somewhere around us. I can't pinpoint exactly where. This one's now, it looks like it's going to sharpen its claws. No. I 
Okay, the Impala that I can hear alarm calling are ahead of our vehicle to the left, further east of us, and it looks like the lions are going to continue in their original direction of movement, which was north and east. We're in the middle of a big block between Mvubu Road, Gauri Cutline, and Buffalo Cutline, our northern boundary. They are heading towards our northern boundary, so that's one small concern. But we're still going to have some time with them before they do cross, if they do, in fact, cross at all. Here are all these aardvark excavations. Looks very active here, so this would be a good place to come and do a stake out one night to see if we can't get an aardvark exiting from its home under the ground, its daytime home. Hmm. I'm going to try and take the path of least resistance to catch us back up with these line. Uh, and I think it may take us a little bit of time, so this would be another good opportunity to get you guys back to that hyena den. We've just moved slightly in order to get a better view. We've come up to the front of the den where we often park, and uh, not much has changed. Same two adults here. In fact, one of the adults has gone off pretty, who I think was the one we were looking at earlier. Uh, in front of the vehicle has moved off and the cubs are still here November and the two D's are out ooh, ooh, Dave quickly to the left there's the little cub the tiny little one the matriarch's cub is out isn't that wonderful now I am amazed by the here's the second one now this is so cool I am amazed by how patient Madam is. So that is Madam, that's the mother. And when these two Ds were born, of course, they were born in the other den. And they were born to Corky and November was still around there. And it was amazing how sort of impatient Corky was with November and how impatient Pretty was well, not quite as impatient, but also she was quite impatient with those two D twins who were not her own. It's amazing to watch the matriarch here, so patient and tolerant of the, all the youngsters around her, biting her bottom, chewing on her tail. She's completely tolerant of them. And I think that's incredible. And we did have a suggestion a few months ago now that maybe that's why she is the matriarch. She has this sort of... Um, better attuned social grace, if you like. I don't, I'm not sure that's what it is, of course, because the matriarch is normally uh, an inherited position, but maybe it's a, rather a function of the fact that she is the dominant, that she is more patient with the others. But clearly, they're quite honored to have the queen here playing nursemaid. Now, we think that there are 17 or so hyenas in this clan. And Stefan, you want to know, or adult hyenas, that is, you want to know are the other females who are low ranking in a pack outside of the den? No, probably not, Stefan. We think that they would be hanging around uh, probably in ones and twos. They'll forage in ones and twos during the course of the evening. And then during the day, they'll go to sleep probably near water on a hot day. Otherwise, uh, just under a bush on a cool day like this. So they won't necessarily hunt together. Uh, they don't do a great deal of hunting here. They largely scavenge in this particular area. In East Africa, you'd probably find them more often. Right, back to the lines with Scott. OK, now we've just found a little opening that these lions are about to pop into. Here it comes, VM. and they're being quite playful. So I wanted to call you back here in the hope that we could see another epic bout of play. What's this lioness doing? It's a combination of them playing with one another and possibly knowing that there's something to stalk nearby. The rest of the proud are slowly making their way towards this one. So I think we are in a good spot to see a little bit more playful banter. Let's see what this girl's up to. She getting ready to lay an ambush for the rest of her pride. I think she could be, uh, she's seen the others now. 
Now watch her body language. Here she goes, flattening herself to the ground, getting ready to pounce on her friends. It is quite tricky in this thick bush to try and forecast where the action is going to unfold, but at least if you are in the vehicle with us, you do have a chance of seeing a glimpse of this action. VM on the left here, the one's gone up a tree. Not easy to see, there we go, spot on. Incredible. I'm just gonna try and push forward quickly, we don't get to see lines of trees very often. Tricky. There should be a little gap there where you can see what's going on. There we go. <laughs> Yay! That didn't work out too badly. <laughs> uh, we have been having such fantastic sizing of these ladies again. Here come the rest of them. Jenny, on Twitter, you'd like to know if the lions are possibly having all this playful banter due to the kind of post-adrenaline high after chasing those in Yala and Impala earlier. Possibly. I think that is the case. VM back up onto the tree here. This one's scratching its claws. And that's how they maintain and manicure their claws, by... scratching them and sharpening them against these trees. It just keeps the edges at a fine, sharp point. This is so cool. Hello to Lisa, who's just got back from a safari to the Serengeti, where she noticed the lions are spending quite a lot of the time up in trees there. And it's not uncommon for lions of certain areas to climb up into trees. It's usually areas with a lot of tsetse flies and or just general flies and also heat. And that's not really that common in South Africa, though. I don't know of too many tree climbing prides in South Africa, which is just interesting. I mean, we still have flies here. We still have hot weather here. But possibly just not the right trees. There's not too many trees that are as easy to climb as maybe the ones that are climbing up in Tanzania and other areas where I have noticed tree climbing. What on earth are you looking for in here? <laughs> um, anyway. She eventually made it through. Oh, VM, get ready for another pounce there. There's a lioness lying. Just, you can see her. Look at that. And she's going to pounce on this one. That's walking. I think that's Amber Eyes that's in hiding there. No. Look at how fascinating that camouflage is. You can just see her two eyes blinking, really. Awesome. So yes, Lisa, interesting stuff, but it's not uncommon for certain lions to climb trees. They're never going to climb them as well as a leopard can climb a tree. But obviously, the more they, the individual prides do climb, the, the better they become at it. No different to anything, really, I guess, in life. Let's try and reposition so we can get you some screenshots of her on this fallen down marula tree before she disembarks. Beautiful. Hello. Perfectly framed by the leaves of the bush willow in front of her. Wonderful. Now, if you are a new viewer, or even if you're an old viewer that is yet to discover the magic that is screenshots, I suggest you work out how to do it. It's a great way to document what happens on safari. 
and keep tabs of all of your favorite sightings and experiences with us. After all their play, it seems like the ladies are having a bit of a breather. This one's looking actually in the best shape out of all of them. The other ones that I can see, like the one in front of us, is panting quite heavily. Hi, Kathy. Are you interested to know whether or not we think that the oldest lioness in this pride, which is not Amber Eyes, has possibly slipped in rank. And that's why we notice Amber Eyes is beginning to lead the pride now. Uh, and it's, a, it's hard to tell exactly what's what, Kathy. And um, Vian, there's another one on its way here. Um, but yes, possibly that is, it possibly is the case. Maybe the older lady is now kind of retiring and handing over her, oh, are you joking? A big hug, literally. I mean, what next? Let's see if I can't get you a slightly better angle now. Hold on. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Absolutely awesome. Got us into a bit of a predicament here with regarding the vehicle's position, but it seems to be working for now. I just fear that if... Oh, no, that's still going to... Oh, shame, did you hurt yourself there? Again, an example of why lions are not very good. Actually, watch the one above there, Vian. Looks like it, too, is about to come tumbling down. So yes, Kathy, I don't know how much we can read into it just yet. Um, it, it's not going to make a huge difference, you know, to a proud of lion, whoever is in charge, like I said, it doesn't have huge benefits. It's just like they are deciding upon themselves to, to lead the pride. It's not like there's an alpha pair that get benefits from being in charge. It just kind of naturally happens that one will decide to lead by example. Let's try and creep forward a little bit, Vian. Um, it's not going to be easy. We've got branches everywhere here, but I think it is going to be worthwhile. There we go. Our antenna is now horizontal, which may... Oh, no, it's not. It's popped back up. There we go. Much better. I'm going to get my camera out now. Speaking of screenshots, I think this would be a good opportunity to fire off some shots myself. I have to be quick, though. The action is about to unfold. We're well, very, very happy to hear that a lot of you are loving the sighting because this is unique and wonderful. What is not wonderful is that I've just realized that my camera battery is not charged. Whoopsie, bad planning. I think I should have another one somewhere there. Oh. I don't think that is the case. So, I'll put my camera away and simply soak in these memories, as opposed to try and capture them. Look at that view! Eye level with the line just a few meters away from us. It doesn't get much better. It really doesn't. Yes, we are talking about you. You can continue to stare directly down VM's weapon of choice, the camera. I'm just going to give a quick update to the game drive stations as to where we are, in case anybody does want to come here a little bit later, and just so that guys can keep in mind what's going on here. Updates on Kohumas, they are now midway between Mvubu and Gauri Cutline, I would say about 200 meters south of Buffalo Cutline. Hi, 
right, Jared. You have obviously been missing sightings of the dominant male coalition. Oh, no way. There's a lion that's trying to climb up a marula tree. Hold tight, everyone. Um, Jared, you've obviously been missing the Birmingham boys, the dominant coalition of male lions, and are wondering if the presence of these ladies is going to increase the likelihood of them coming back. Yes, most certainly. Hold tight, everyone. We're about to get into a more epic, epic position here. Wow. Oh. Try to get this antenna out the way. Sorry, dear. Here we go. The tree climbing lines of Juma, they're practicing. We see them up trees more and more often, but maybe that's just because our luck has just been phenomenal recently with regards to catching them in action. Here we go. What's going to happen with these two? Using the tree to try and stalk up on one another. Who knows what they can smell there? Possibly the scent of a leopard. Definitely paying some interest to this marula tree which is one of the most comfortable trees for a lion to climb. It's a pity that um, the positioning of our vehicle together with the lion has not been conducive for any VR rigging at the moment. But we are waiting, hoping that we're going to be able to capture some of these moments. The problem is you need to be so close for those little cameras to have any effect, even from where we are here, which is probably 10 meters away, you'd hardly be able to see the lions. Come on. Feel free to jump back up one more time. The others are continuing to move, so I think it's going to be best to stay with the ones in front. That's generally the best rule when sticking with these animals. <clears throat> that way we can hope that the rest of the pride will rejoin them, as they naturally do, and be in a stable position to try and film any action that may unfold. There's a hole here, but I'm going to risk just driving over it. Hopefully, we won't fall into it. Sometimes the wheels cave in either side of a burrow. But we got lucky there. you would like to know if by following these animals we ever interfere with their hunting and we try as much as possible to have as little impact as possible but it would be a lie if we said we had zero impact of course we're driving the vehicle through the bush making a noise sometimes impacting positively for a lion and sometimes acting negatively for the lion. Sometimes we will help their prey escape, and sometimes we may help them succeed. But the, the, the moral of the story is an important thing to remember here is that that is not our intentions. Our intentions are to be as sensitive as possible and allow nature to uh, unfold with us merely being spectators. But in order for us to see these animals and in order for these animals to protect, be protected, they need to be seen. Conservation requires money, and this is an ex a perfect example of how ecotourism does keep an area like this safe. This is privately owned land where landowners see the commercial benefits of following animals. So if it was going to have a major negatively negative impact on their existence, then we would probably have noticed that already. We would have probably noticed that these animals are hungry, undernourished. They probably would be a lot less tolerant of our vehicles if they felt that we were chasing away their prey. 
So, no, I don't think it's having any significant impact that should prevent us from continuing to do it. And I think it would be more negative if we were to not follow these animals around than if we were to. So I hope that makes sense. There's another lion coming straight past us on the left. There are still three more pride members that need to catch up with these two. And I'm sure they're going to take a very similar pathway. Oh, it's wonderful now. What's interesting is that judging by these two body language, it looks like they have, in fact, seen or heard something up ahead. You can see she's moving quite slowly. Her ears are pricked up, listening intently. So again, good prospects. The two of them are both look looking in the same direction. And who knows what lies ahead up there, but I'm almost certain there is some more prey. Here comes another lioness from in front of the vehicle. The third of the five. to take a rest next to the vehicle. That suits us perfectly. We're very happy that you've decided to lie down just three meters away from us. And Amy, this is a good example of what little of an effect we have on their lives. And if they didn't like us and didn't appreciate us following them through the bush, I don't think they'd be acting the way they are now. The other two appear to be moving off and do also appear to be in stealth mode. I've just heard some branches breaking, so it could be a herd of elephants that these lions have heard, but hard to be certain. Oh, this one's getting up. I'm just going to try and reposition another one straight in front of us now. She's also looking focused. She'll be reading into the body language of these others. And what I'm going to try and do probably quickly now is reposition the vehicle so that we can try and film them as they move off in a more kind of westerly direction. That appears to be where the sound or, or smell is that's exciting the other lions in front of us. Oh, no. I'm not going to suggest going across to James just yet. Um, like something could unfold at any point in time. Because I know there is some potential action up ahead here, I'm specifically going to be driving a very wide berth around these lions. Um, again, it's difficult for you guys uh, sitting in the comfort of your homes to realize exactly what the scenarios we are dealing with here on the ground. So that's another thing that I guess causes a lot of concern on your guys' behalf for the way we may follow these animals. But I guess you just have to trust that our intentions and our experience of doing this is of a sufficient level to not impact or interfere greatly with what's going on. Oh, hello. Ah well, I spotted the VM. I had no idea she was here. I was keeping an eye on the other four members of the Pride, which appear to still be slinking their way through a quite thick 
block of vegetation. This one's possibly just getting a good vantage point of the rest of them. And again, a wonderful high-level view of her, even though it was brief. It makes such a difference viewing animals at the same level that they are sitting at, I find. Whereas now we're kind of looking considerably down on them. VM and the camera are elevated considerably. I mean, they're kind of at my eye level looking down, which does make a difference. Now, where to go next? This is inc incredibly thick in front of us. So I think at this point, we may want to think about sending you across to James back at the hyena den, because we're going to need to do quite a big loop around them again to just make sure we don't interfere and we, we don't need to have you along with for that little section of the adventure. So off you go, and we will catch up shortly. I have to confess, everybody, that this is a tremendously soporific and peaceful atmosphere that has enveloped the hyena den. Um, while you've been away watching the lions having their action, the hyenas have been playing and they've been suckling, and now they're starting to settle down a bit. And it's uh, creating some sort of heavy eyelids in uh, my head. But here comes a little one now. Very confident these days. And of course, they're confident because they are the offspring of the matriarch. So let's just see what they do. Just watching us carefully. I think probably looking at the lights, because the lights of the vehicle look like two great big eyes, of course, staring out. So I'm sure a little thing like that almost perceives us. Dave, just go to the left there. Sorry, there's, there are two Franklins coming up. Just left of that, two little birds. There, look at them. Look at them coming right up to the hole of the den. Two little crested Franklins. I don't know. The, Hyenas haven't seen them yet. I'm sure that baby would react if they did. That's so fun. <laughs> Coming. <laughs> Here come the hyenas. There, yeah, they've been spotted. <laughs> they've been spotted. <laughs> They'll get scuttling off, although that looks quite playful. Were those hyenas go? Oh, sorry, back to the lions. Okay, the lioness is just ahead of us and she is stalking a Cape buffalo that is also directly ahead of us. You can just see a dark blob to the right of the murder tree. It's moving off. The lion is to the left of it, moving towards it. I cannot see the lion in the in the shot now but i'm fairly certain it is in the frame somewhere she's just sticking to the ground and this is exactly what we were hoping for lions hunting buffalo is one of the most awesome things you could ever hope to see on an african safari Yay! just gonna try and get us into a good spot in case action does start unfolding, which I'm fairly certain is imminent. And what I want to try and do is get us onto the other side of the buffalo. Naturally, the lion will chase the buffalo towards us. If we do get onto the other side of them, that's giving us some great views. just to decide where to stop exactly. I think we've got a nice little opening section here and we are about to be in position A. We could not ask to be getting into a better position than we are now. Just hold tight, bear with me for 10 more seconds and then we'll be able to stop the vehicle. So the lion are to the left of the buffalo, they're on the other side of the buffalo, and as calm as this scene may appear now, things are about to change at any second. 
Now, there is a small chance that the buffalo could run into the vehicle as they, or very close to it at least, but just hold tight, don't jump out with, of the vehicle, and everything will be okay. They are just going to get a big fright naturally when they do realize these lions are upon them. These are all big Cape buffalo bulls, not easy prey for lions, but I'm certain we are at least going to see a chase. My heart is racing. Vian, I don't know if you want to pan to the left a bit of this individual. You can see a lion moving through the bush there. Yeah, there you go. So the lion are very close. Look at her creeping up to them. I'm not sure where the other buffalo are, or sorry, where the other lion are, but at the moment she's probably about 20 meters away from the closest buffalo to her. At this stage, the buffalo have no idea that the lion are here. I cannot tell which way the wind is blowing. Which means that I cannot tell if and when these buffalo are going to catch wind of the lion. Here comes the lion. She's moving closer. And she's about to pop out into a little clearing where you'll be able to see her better. The others could be looping around, but at this stage, I still have not got visual of even one of them. Isn't this fascinating? Look at her flattening herself to the ground. This is not a common view that we get. Oof. Something's about to happen. I've just seen a second lioness pop out. And Via, maybe if you just zoom out, you're going to get a much better idea of how close she is to this buffalo at the moment. She is very, very close. But waiting for the opportune moment. You wouldn't believe it, but another Pride member has decided to lie down at this critical stage of the hunt. Oh, there's another one, though, that's popped up. You can see it in the background. So at least she's getting some support from another member of the Pride. Oh, can you believe this? This is absolutely awesome. Oh, I think the buffalo have sent something. You see the way that buffalo that's closest to her has just stopped, lifted its head. I think they may be able to smell something, even though ever so slightly. It may have just got the faintest whiff of a lioness. You can see her directly in front of our vehicle now. Oh! Fascinating. Oh, there we go. Here they go. And... Now, let's see what happens. Once these buffalo start running, that's the best chance that the lion are going to have of actually bringing one down. They need to turn them and get them on the run, which has not happened now. It's probably going to be a turn of events, and now the buffalo are actually turning to start facing these lions. Here they come. Keep an eye on the buffalo, VM. That's where the action is going to be. And like I say, obviously, they've got a big shock. They didn't know that lions were creeping up on them. But now that they have regrouped in just a few seconds, you'll find that they're going to turn on these lions and start chasing them. Here we go. That's exactly what we expected to see. Here comes one lion from the right. And how quickly the roles are reversed. But like I said initially, there is... Here comes this buffalo coming all out on its own. And now this is when things can go wrong. When a buffalo is this bold and now it's separated itself from the rest of the herd, it may give these lions an opportunity to jump on its back. So their boldness is sometimes what causes them to become unstuck. But they back themselves for a reason. I mean, these animals have come across lion many, many times. And you can see three lions slinking away there with that one buffalo pacing after them, not a care in the world, it appears, even though the other herd members don't seem to be following it, although there's one that's directly in front of us now that's charging about, not as boldly as the other. Well, this is, I guess, a good uh, example why lions and buffalo are eternal enemies. It's very difficult business for them to hurt one another, I guess difficult for the buffalo to hurt the lion, but more importantly, very difficult for the predator to bring down their prey.
maybe under the cover of darkness, things would have been different when the buffalo can't see as well. That will put the lions in a major advantage in a scenario like this. But right now, it would require a small miracle and a very unlucky buffalo for us to see the Inkuhumas successfully bring one down. This lioness, though, is still kind of thinking about the fact that she could get lucky. The other buffaloes that we saw marching those other three ladies off, I think I can still hear grunting off to our left. But for now, it's a bit of a stalemate and a standoff with at least the one remaining lioness here and the buffalo that are in this area. There's one that's just poking its head out around that bush there. Um, you can faintly see VM is doing a great job on camera, everyone. It's incredibly difficult to try and show you all the different angles in a scenario like this on top of our own excitement that is bubbling over. I think it might be worth, I don't know whether we should go and follow that big buffalo that's leading the charge, chasing the, those other three off. We should stay here. But let's give it a few more seconds before we make up our mind. As long as we've got one line in our sights, that's good, because then we will be able to relocate with the rest of the pride, regardless of what happens. I don't think it makes sense for James to come here. It's going to take too long for him to get here, and we are in the middle of quite a thick block, so I don't think a second vehicle would be useful here. But don't worry, if I did feel that was the case, I would be certain to get a hold of him on the radio to try and increase our chances of getting some better shots. Look at this one's tail curled up in disgust. <laughs> it's been huffing and puffing. I think it's trying to work out where a lion is that it can chase. Hello, Mars in Arizona, and very happy to hear that you have been loving our lucky sightings we've been sharing with the Inkuhuma Pride. It's so good to have them back, like you say. Um, I have heard rumors of Junior being spotted not too far from here in the Kruger. It is possible, but I just battle to be certain that it's him and not another young male lion, which it could very easily be. Unless anybody has any very distinctive scars or notches. Uh, let's see what happens here, Vim. I think this buffalo has caught wind of the lion here. Um, Unless Junior had any very distinctive characteristics that can, we can be 100% certain of that it is him, I fear it's, it, it doesn't make sense to speculate. Um, but, of course, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, and there are certainly speculations that he has been seen. Again, if anybody can just confirm that for certain. Oh, here she comes. And as she starts moving, oh, the buffalo thundered off, as opposed to chasing her, which is what I thought the option was going to be. And as soon as they run, look at how her tension and her body language changes. Now she's thinking, oh, I can maybe catch one of these because they are triggering the chase mechanism. And that's why it's so important that if and when you are under threat by a predator on foot, it's best to stand your ground. Just like the buffalo did. They've made the lion think twice. But as soon as the buffalo ran, like they did there, the lion immediately thought, oh, this is looking far more favorable. So that was a very good lesson for us, a visual lesson, to see how body language and behavior can impact hugely on a predator's behavior. Now, I've just heard another grunt from that buffalo that went off chasing the other three in the direction that this one line is moving, and I think we could see some action here. You mentioned how silent these lines can, silently rather, these lines can move through the bush, and it is remarkable and so lucky that we got to see them flattening themselves to the ground. That thrill of the chase is such an exciting thing that we so seldom get to see on safari.
again, Amy, I think uh, in that scenario, I don't know if anyone feels differently, but I think we had uh, zero impact on, on, what, on what happened for both the buffalo and the lion. So, again, that is our main focus. And I think the proof is in the pudding, especially in that example that we just witnessed. Okay, well, we are on our northern boundary now, basically, between, this is just a fire break road, and in another 50 meters, these lines could well disappear. I'm interested to see where that other buffalo is with the other three lioness, or possibly four lioness. Gonna keep an eye. Oh, there's one directly to our right now, the same one we've been keeping an eye on. So let's just stay with her for now. I'm not too sure where the others have disappeared to. Hello, Georgia and in Illinois and I think you've raised a good point for all of those who are skeptical about how we position the vehicle and how close we may get to the animals. And the fact that we can zoom into the creatures can sometimes distort reality and make it feel like we are much closer than we actually are. So that's a good point from George Ann. Thank you for raising that. And like I said, unless you're sitting here, um, you cannot, well, it would be unfair to be able to judge from the few views that you're getting as to what the entire situation actually is that's unfolding around us. And also, I guess that, coupled with the fact that many of you have never been safari guides before, is probably also something that you can bear in mind. And like we've said before, a lot of concern shown for Karula and her den sites and her cubs. All of us that work here do it because we love nature and love the animals that live here. And our aim is not to harm them or hurt them or interfere with their lives. And that, I guess, is fundamental and final. Oh, OK, I've just seen a buffalo. Just going to creep forward to get you a view of it. It's the one that marched off the rest of the pride. It's just somewhere off to our right here. Buffalo's directly in front of us, staring down at us, and here's one lion in the foreground. Where the others are, I'm not too sure. But like I said earlier, the boldness of this individual may cause it to come unstuck, but it doesn't look like these ladies are interested at the moment, or at least this one. And you'll probably find she's just wanting to catch up with the rest of the pride. She may well be able to do so without even having to call them. She could well be just following the scent trail. OK, looks like we found the rest of the pride. I'm just going to stop here. It looks like there could be a bit more playful post-buffalo hunt adrenaline, as one of you suggested earlier. I take the frustrations of being ridiculed by the buffalo and playing with themselves. You may have just heard a buffalo grunting in disgust. I creep forward again, I'm not in the best spot here. Can we go? Okay, just uh finish for the game. Uh maybe four or five meters. Well we're in luck there. Evidently, are now heading in an easterly direction parallel to our northern boundary. And for those of you who are new to these live safaris, we do have 
perimeters, but the animals don't, which is the perfect way to have things as opposed to the other way around. So it's just an invisible boundary. That is a road. But the animals could cross over and then we would wave them goodbye. Just trying to get a gap on the game drive radio. Um, so that I can inform guys where we are again. Stations in Kumas and are very close to Buffalo's cut line, conclusion of the fire break. I think slightly closer to Gali cut line. Oh, just took a kidney shot there from one of those branches. Patam! Matthew in Michigan. You'd like to know what would happen if the buffalo got a hold of these lions with their horns. Would they just try and injure them or would they try and kill them? Well, they would most certainly be trying to kill them. They don't want to just give them like a slap on the wrists. They would do everything in their power to maim and kill the lion for obvious reasons. They are eternal enemies. Whether or not the buffalo is capable of killing the lions with just one horn flick is another story, but it has happened in the past. Uh, the buffalo may not kill the lion, or the injury may not kill the lion immediately there and then. A lot of wounds that lions receive from buffalo prove fatal in a couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, sometimes they can kill them outright or just leave them with a fatal injury. I've seen a buffalo once toss a lioness into the sky as if she was a ragdoll. She just went kind of three somersaults. And bearing in mind that's 120 kilograms, over 240 pounds of animal that the buffalo tosses into the air as if it is a little toy. Okay, okay. Picked up a stowaway. Looks like we got rid of the branch that was stuck below the vehicle, so that's good. are just off to our right now, moving parallel to us. Lucy in South Bend, Indiana. I'm not sure if I'm understanding you correctly, but you'd like to know if the buffalo curl themselves up so that the lions cannot catch them. Sorry, Lucy, I'm missing a vital part of your question. Oh, curl the, their tails up so the lions cannot catch them. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think that's the reason, Lucy. Um, lion do not latch onto buffalo's tails when trying to catch them. That would be ineffective. They need something like their rump or their bottom. Um, maybe once the pride has brought down the buffalo, one may bite onto its tail, but it's not going to be a go-to point uh, when hunting. And maybe the buffalo's tails will curl up through default but it's not to try and have less appendages for the lions to latch onto. And you can imagine, I mean, when a buffalo is running around, its tail is going to be probably flaying wildly in the air. It's not going to be slapped against, sorry, Vim, uh, slapped against its body, as we did see very briefly when it was walking. There's a very slight drizzle that's falling down on us now. Now, I know we're following lions, but there's an incredibly pretty bird that I haven't been able to show you for quite some time. Look at that. A woodlands kingfisher in all its glory. How much niyama does she have there? 
Now the lines are ma moving parallel to us because the vegetation is very thick. I'm not going to make an effort to pop in just yet. So we're going to have to be patient with regards to our next view. Hi there, Ghost Ninja. And haven't heard your very easy to remember name before. You'd like to know what stops the lions from attacking us. And a combination of things, I guess, a history of humans hunting and killing animals has given them inherent fear of us initially. So if we were to rewind the clocks and go back to Africa when there were hardly any people walking around or moving through these wilderness areas. If you were to walk up to animals or even drive up to them, uh, they would run away from us. They are scared of us. And that's the same of, of some animals, even in the Krug National Park. Animals that are not habituated to vehicles and to humans are scared of us and they'll run away. And because this reserve has been running for now close on 65 years as a photographic safari destination, the human presence and the correctly behaved human presence has given these animals no reason to fear us, no reason to see us as food, and we are merely neutral subjects in their environment. Well spotted VM, one of the ladies has just popped out. I wonder if there's something that they're hunting. Again, the body language suggests that something has caught their attention just up ahead of them. So yes, Ghost Ninja, it's uh, many years of gentle habituation and basically our brain power standing our ground if and when they charge, preventing them from thinking that we are prey that would naturally run off. All examples of how, over a long period of time, these animals have got used to us. Just as well, because as you can see, we are in an open vehicle and it would be incredibly easy for them to jump onto us if they desired. But as you can see, and as you would have probably noticed from the course of the different sightings and interactions we have had with them this morning, they are not interested in our behavior. I'm just going to roll forward. There's another tree that looks like they're going to climb up. Oh, yeah, beautiful. Hello, ladies. You are really putting on a serious performance for us today and we are thoroughly grateful for it. I can see the other three slowly approaching, so hopefully when they perch themselves on the tree, at least their heads may be unobstructed, as the current ones clearly are, but I'm not going to try and move the vehicle from here. It's a little bit thick, and I think we do have our best angle at this point. Looks like the others are about to also mount the marula. Let's see what happens here. And if I'm not mistaken, this is our third different sighting of these lions up different trees. Oh, look at that one branch wobbling as the heavy weight of the lion gets to the terminal edge. It would be hilarious if that branch broke, although we do not want that to happen. Hello, Blaise C. You would like to know if we've ever seen lions hunting monkeys. And sadly, no, I have not in my career seen them doing that. Although it does happen from time to time, they will hunt not only monkeys, but baboons as well. There comes one lady making her way towards us now. And... Trent's just driving past. You may have heard a vehicle. He's on his way to a leopard sighting. Uh, 
Uh, I'm sorry, Blasey, you'd like to know uh, the likelihood of uh, elephants hunting, uh, elephants hunting monkeys, lions hunting monkeys. And uh, as I was saying, it, it's not very, not very uh, commonly seen phenomenon, at least not in this area. More likely prey species would be baboon. They're slightly bigger and therefore slightly easier for a lion to catch. But leopards are renowned for hunting primates, both monkey and baboon. We've seen Kunyuma, a three-year-old male leopard. He's just over three now. He caught and killed a baboon very close to the Voyatilla camp. Some of you will remember that from a f probably five or six months ago. And Karula, his mother, also fed on a vervet monkey that we got to see, again, probably four or five months ago. Um, but interestingly, the leopards of the Sabi Sands have not really become renowned for their baboon hunting schools, at least not the ones that I've known, whereas in other areas of Africa, it can become more likely. I'm just going to try and get you guys a slightly different angle. The one lioness is sleeping up there. Oh, there we go. That's not too bad. Let's see if we, we can't creep you into a slightly different spot. So you do get leopards and, uh, and even lions areas that will become primate hunters. That should work. <laughs> you have found a perfect spot and uh, look as comfortable as a leopard would. Up in that tree, look at it wobbling ever so slightly as she breathes gently bending under her weight. So I can see the one in the tree that we are watching. There's an, another two lying down next to one another, just off to our right below the tree, and then another, the other two I've just spotted in front of us. It wasn't incredible how quickly they disappear. There's the one. So that's number four, and then number five off to the left, just to keep you guys updated as to where they all are. I cannot stress how fortunate we, we've been with their decided route this morning. They've been coasting along our northern boundary for quite some time now. Sure, Mike in Florida and Wicked Anne, you'd like to know which bird was calling whilst the lions were hunting the buffalo. It sounded like a distant zebra calling. Whew, I wish I could remember. The only call that I think you could confuse with a zebra calling is maybe a hornbill in the distance. Um, Yellow-billed hornbill, maybe. Uh, even the red-billed hornbill, both are fairly zebra-like cause, or it would have possibly been a zebra. I just find it hard to believe that you would have heard a zebra over, you know, before I would have pointed it out. Um, it would have been something that would have caught my attention. My situational awareness should have captured that. Um, but possibly you did hear it. I don't know, maybe the excitement caused me to overlook that. I'm gonna play a hornbill now. That may... Oh, no, it appears like my phone is... Oh, hang on. No. My phone is not wanting to make volume noises. So, I cannot play any calls for you. Can you believe it? I don't think I've ever seen a lion this comfortable in a tree within the Sabi Sands. This is a first for me. And I hope you're all thoroughly enjoying this. And as much as this has been a wonderful sighting, I think it's just about time that we send you across to James for a quick update on what he's up to. 
Sounds like you've been having the most wonderful lion sighting. That's great stuff. I'm sad they haven't killed, but they will no doubt stalk again. Here is a kudu eating a buffalo thorn tree, and in the background, you might just be able to see the flicking tails of a herd of impala. She's quite confiding. Normally, they do sort of disappear quite quickly, but things are very calm out here at the moment. We've come to the far western side of Juma, just hoping perhaps to pick up some tracks of a female leopard, Shadow. We haven't seen her for a long time. And I got an update from Arethusa to the west of us uh, this yesterday evening. They had no tracks either. All the action seemed to be happening far to the west of them. So we're just going to look around here carefully and see what we can find as we go along. The hyena den continued to be sort of active. Uh, we eventually left the little ones suckling with their mother. They're all safe, they're all happy. They seem to be completely content at the moment and they suffered no ill effects as a result of the lions paying them a visit yesterday evening. So that is really good news indeed. You can see the weather remains cloudy. It's beautiful. We're very pleased for the cloud and the shade. And although it's starting to heat up again, this week. It's, I think we might be over the worst of the heat. As March approaches, it's normally when it sort of tails off, we'll get days of 34 or 35 degrees or so, but out here that's relatively cool. And I mean, that's what are we looking at in just sort of around 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not tremendously awful for this particular area. That said, lots of animals don't like this weather, of course because it's difficult for them to smell what's coming to see them. There's a sort of prevailing wind and the blusters around the place. And then also the cloud makes it a little bit easier for things like those lions to be stalking at this time of the day. It's cooler and it certainly helps them to hide in the lack of light. And you've watched them now, of course, stalk a number of buffalo. I think they chase a nyala or two. So they're having quite a good time, but predators love this sort of weather. The prey, not so much. Now, here's a very good way to stop and ask the question. So, a new viewer called These Lions, as far as I can understand, but that's a very interesting Twitter handle you have there. Oh, Steve Lyons, sorry, uh, bad radio communications in this particular area. Now, Dave, if you can just um, pan around here. Steve Lyons, you worried about the fact that we're having a drought. You say you've heard that we're in a drought, and where is the nearest water hole? Well, Steve, you can see we are in the middle of a drought. That clearing that you're looking at now should be a verdant green color at this time of the year, but it is a gray and sort of yellowing a uh, mass of dung and one or two sprigs of grass. And this is actually a pretty good area for this time of, uh, you know, a lot of the other clearings are completely free of any kind of vegetation. But the nearest watering hole, you know, we're in the Sabi Sands, which is the western sector of the Great Kruger National Park. You actually can't get more than two and a half kilometers from water in this area. Uh, two and a half kilometers and miles would turn around at about sort of four miles or so. And, sorry, not four miles, you'd go the other way, about one and a half miles. You can't get any further than that away from water. And that is not because this place is an abundantly wet area. It is because human beings have pumped water all over the place. Now, this, of course, has a number of effects. The first effect, of course, is that it means that animals don't die off nearly as fast in a drought as they would otherwise. And that's quite a good thing for the animals, of course. It's not a good thing for the vegetation, though, because if all the animals survive, what happens is that they eat all the vegetation. We get a state of overgrazing and overbrowsing. The forage can't re recover. And then when the rains do come, we get soil erosion and that sort of thing. So that is one of the considerations of providing artificial water. I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but it's certainly a consideration. And so although we've been in a drought, we are in a drought, Many of the animals are not actually showing any effects in this particular part of the world. But if you go further east into the Kruger Park, where they've closed a lot of the water points, very wisely in my opinion, um, the animals are really starting to struggle. They've also had even less rain than we've had here. We've had about a sixth of the normal rain that we have normally. I think in the Kruger National Park it, itself, further east of here, they've probably had less than 
maybe about a tenth, between a tenth and a sixth of the rain that they normally have, and so there is no grass. You can see around us here, even as we drive along, the leaves are wilting in the trees, and not only are they wilting, they are turning autumnal gold already, which is just way, it's way too early for that to be happening normally. And in the Kruger, further east of us, that situation is that much worse because they've had so little rain. So we're in a big drought. This is the worst drought and the hottest summer in recorded history, which uh, when you consider that the records have been kept for the last 112 years, that is an exceptionally um, difficult thing for all the biota out here to deal with. But it's a fascinating time if you're able to kind of remove yourself from the situation and just watch it as a kind of human being observer, well, then it becomes really interesting to see how things are going to cope out here, how the landscape will cope, how the herbivores will cope, and how the carnivores will cope. And the carnivores at the moment are having a very good time of it because they don't worry too much about water. Most of them are actually water independent. They don't have to drink. Um, and as the herbivores weaken, their prey weakens, so it will be easier for them to feed. That will reach a tipping point, of course, and once the herbivore numbers drop below a certain level, and once the amount of fat that they have, because they will be now using all their fat reserves, they'll get skinnier and skinnier, it will mean that the amount of food and the amount of nutrition that they provide to the carnivores will start to dip slowly. So it's all going to be rather interesting. To remain, of course, totally neutral in a situation like this, especially if animals start to die off, is almost completely impossible. And while we pretend to be observers in the wilderness, we are far more participants than we care to admit most of the time, even if it is an emotional participation as opposed to a physical one. Anyway, that's the drought, Steve Lyons. I think it's time of year and if you're a new viewer, which I think you are, it would be very, it's very good uh, that you have joined at this time because I think it's going to be an interesting one. It's slightly distressing. And we're going to get a lot of questions. If this drought does continue, there's going to be a lot of question about, from our viewers, about why we don't feed the animals, why we don't bring in water, why, how can we allow the suffering to occur? And those are valid questions. And the basic answer to them would be, well, we try to have as little effect as possible. We try and let nature take its course. And that can be a very painful thing sometimes. But it will remain to be seen what happens over the coming months. The earth is full of surprises. We get very different rain regimes. Maybe we'll just have a wet winter. We just don't know what's going to happen. I'm just going to show you a viewpoint over here. And, uh, Steve Lyons, it's our pleasure, of course, for just thanking me for answering your question. And that is what we do out here, and it's a pleasure to hear from you. Now, Dave, in the absence of my ability to find any kind of heartbeat or animal, let's have a look over here at the view. And that just gives you an interesting look at the color. Again, in a normal rainfall year, that would be a totally green scene. It wouldn't be sort of pockmarked with gold. And that golden color is the trees wilting that you can see there. The trees losing their green color already. Which I think is rather interesting. Here are a few birds around here. I just don't think many of them are going to be viewable with this little camera. There's one on the ground there, Dave. Before you move the camera, let me try and point it out to you a bit better. It's flown up into the tree here. I'm just going to go around the corner. I think there's a bit of a bird party going on here. See the stick on the ground here. You can see this first scraggly bush in front of us. And there's a stick there, there. It's just flown off, obviously. I think it's a grey-headed sparrow. But there are a number of seed-eating birds around here. I can hear some canaries calling. There are some waxbills calling. We'll just sit here for a little bit while I answer Book Diva's question. Book, D 
book diva. Um, <laughs> you want, do you know if what um, if the weather will affect the bird distribution and the birds that we get here? Book diva, it absolutely affects the birds that we get here. And I was just saying, I'm going to move on because I think these little sea beetles are really difficult to find with the camera. Um, book diva. It makes it very dif difficult for the birds, and we've certainly had far fewer breeding birds. I think almost no weavers this year have built nests and bred here. I mean, there have been some breeding birds, certainly. I mean, Scott found a red-breasted swallow's nest just two days ago, which is astonishing. We've had um, lilac-breasted rollers breeding, and we've had hornbills breeding, but I think there's been much less breeding than normal. All right, sorry, we're going back to the lions. I think they're about to leave. So, we have repositioned, and one of the lioness did get up. I thought she was going to come and rub herself up affectionately to another pride member, but she just flopped herself down alone. It appears like they may have finished their activities for the morning. I hope I'm wrong, but judging by their behavior and judging by statistics of this pride and past experiences, I feel like they may take a snooze here for the rest of the day. Of course, there is a chance that some prey may stumble upon them. And that would be a sure way of changing their behavior. Sure. Well, Billy Joe, you have just made my day, and probably VM's as well. Yep, getting a thumbs up from VM. You've just said that this is the best lion sighting and most exciting action-packed lion sighting that you have had since you started following Safari Live. And for new viewers, can you believe this? Billy Joe's been following since 2007. And that is absolutely awesome. That's a year before I even became a safari guide. And I'm so happy that we were lucky enough to stumble across this pride when we did and share these special moments. And on top of that, Billy Joe, the ladies in FC have just made a little bit of a special presentation of the Inkahuma Lioness and some of the highlights of this morning of them playing. I wish I was getting to watch this with you guys now, but I'm gonna have to watch this when I get back to camp, but enjoy. There we go. Yay! Now, a lot of the images you saw there were absolutely incredible, but probably one of my favorite ones was that moment when the one lioness stood on her back legs and hugged the other lioness in the tree. That was something that I've never seen before, quite like that. And all in just an hour and a half, and considering how much time a lot of you guys have spent sitting with us patiently, waiting for action to unfold, I'm sure you are very happy that finally all of your patience has paid off. I certainly am. But as I said when we got started this morning, they do spend on average 18 to 20 hours every day fast asleep. Now, I think a lot of us are under the kind of false impression, myself included, that as soon as it gets dark, lions start moving, and then they move throughout the darkness until sunrise, and then they kind of go to sleep. But that is not 
the case. They'll move a little bit during the daylight hours, depending on the day, but then even during 11 or 12 hours of darkness, they'll only be moving a couple of hours, maybe three, four, five, possibly six or seven, depending on how hungry they are, but on average. This is what they do best for the majority of their day. They lounge around. I guess no different to a domestic cat that a lot of you will be able to relate to. They do spend an immense amount of time snoozing. And I guess that's one of the things that kind of documentaries make the lives of all safari guides, ourselves included, a little bit difficult. People come out on safari, having watched some wildlife documentaries, which are usually one hour or maybe two hours of action-packed, non-stop entertainment. Um, and often, I, I, I hate to say it, but I'm sure a lot of you will agree with me, they're almost not rep representing a true lifestyle of these animals because it's been a year of footage that's been condensed into an action-packed, often dramatized and not entirely true version of what these animals actually do. And people come out on safari or join our live safaris and think, well, where's all the action? What's going on here? But the reality is what happens here, not often what you see on documentaries. Natasha, you're interested to know how, when tracking lions, you know which direction they're going in. Well, uh, it's quite simple. Their back pad uh, is almost triangular, you could s say, in shape. And the four toes leave a depression in the front of the track, indicating which way they're moving in. So, obviously, it's not an easy thing to do, and, uh, and their, their direction of movement will chop and change, as it has this morning, through varying degrees of bush. Let's see if we can't get a little bit of affection here as the one lioness comes to join the rest of the pride. She should pop into view shortly. Here she comes. So yes, Natasha, it's, it's an incredibly difficult art or skill, the art of tracking. Oh. She wasn't interested in too much affection then. This looks like it's amber eyes. And who knows, maybe she's going to rally her troops for one final hunt. No, it looks like she's looking to get comfortable. <laughs> she just let off a groan of contentment there as she collapsed to the ground. Dill in Iowa. You are interested to know if lions will drool in the anticipation of a tasty meal, just as dogs will. And yes, I do, uh, on several uh, circumstances, remember seeing lions drooling with excitement. Most often, when they have come across a leopard's kill that's hoisted up in a tree above them, and they are trying to problem solve as to how to get up into that tree to get the kill. And that is, uh, for me, the most obvious time that I've seen lions drooling. Obviously, when they're in the thrill of the hunt, I don't think it's a, a, a similar scenario. You can understand how when they can see the meat just dangling there, torturing them, um, it's more likely to in induce a hunger, hunger drool. But obviously, when they're in the thrill of the hunt, they're thinking about other things. So I haven't noticed them drooling in those scenarios, but there's nothing to say that they won't. Interesting, we haven't had too much lion-leopard interaction since we've been here. And seeing as though they are both occur in high densities here, I feel that, again, our credit for such sightings has been building up. Often following lions, you, or even just sitting with a leopard, you will be surprised by a pride of lion coming onto the scene. But I've only remembered one sighting of such a sort where Mvula and Kwatile were mating by twin dams, and two of the Styx lioness chased them up a tree. Some of you will remember that. That was an epic, epic sighting. Good. Well, as the lions slowly fall deeper into a coma, we are going to send you back to James, who has a dazzle of zebra.
So I think we're in a, probably viewing some of the sad herd that lost one of their number to the lions two nights ago. And the Inkuhumas, of course, who you've been watching most of the morning, they t took out a hapless foal around about this area yes, two, two afternoons ago. And I wonder if it isn't from the same herd that we're looking at now. Well, there's two of them at the moment. And there, the zebras seem to spend quite a lot of time in this particular area. There seems to be a bit more grass around here than there is in some of the clearings. And of course, the woodland, though, provides an excellent um, opportunity for the lions to hunt them. So not ideal zebra habitat, but the drought necessitates that they have to be around somewhere where there is something to eat. And they're quite confiding, these ones. They're normally a little bit skittish, definitely watching us quite carefully. I think that's a young stallion. Just moving flies off himself, wagging his tail. Brilliant fly swatter, have all the equids on the back end of their bottoms. It's always so interesting to me to note how unexpressive their faces are, but they still manage to give you some kind of indication of their emotional state. I'm just going to roll forward here. And unlike primates, of course, which are able to move their facial muscles, us especially, I mean, we're particularly good at moving our facial muscles. It's how we draw our social cues from each other. Uh, and then if you look at the carnivores, they're a bit less than us, but they can certainly do it. If you think of a dog pulling its teeth back in order to indicate aggression, a cat might do the same sort of thing when it's growling. The herbivores only have their ears, really. They can't really move their lips. It's only their ears that indicate their mood. Just listen to that. Isn't that beautiful? That's called the black-crowned chagra. Just stunning. Right, on a totally different subject, Dr. Debbie, uh, and a very good subject, of course, how will the drought affect tourism? Dr. Debbie, I, it really does depend on, you know, how things look. So it's a difficult one to answer. If the drought really gets bad, of course, what's going to happen is that the lodges are going to run out of water. They're simply not going to be able to function. They are quite water intensive. And frankly, to call some of them ecotourism destinations is a little bit, um, well, it's to be kind to them. Eco implies some kind of conservation mindedness. But of course, a lot of these luxury lodges consume vast amounts of water. and. When that water runs out, there is simply nothing you can do. So that I mean, there has been a situa there have been situations where camps have had to close down until the aquifers and underground water supplies have replenished themselves. So that's one of the possible consequences. The other consequence, of course, is going to be that this is going to become a difficult landscape to look at. It's going to become denuded of grass. It, the trees, of course, are going to wilt. The animals are going to get thin, and it's not going to look like the normal wilderness paradise that it does. That, of course, is going to make tourists think twice about coming here now. Uh, they'll probably defer their travels. So, Dr. Debbie, I think all in all, I'm afraid I think it's going to have a negative effect on tourism. And tourism, of course, is a massively, massively important part of conservation efforts out here. It's what pays for this land to remain under wildlife and not some other kind of damaging land use. So yes, unfortunately, I think it will affect us negatively. Of course, on the upside, South Africa's exchange rate with the rest of the world is particularly good at the moment. So if you're an um, English person or you're operating in euro or dollars, this is still a pretty cheap destination to come. And those zebras aren't being, you know, they, they certainly don't seem to be uh, badly affected at the moment by the drought. And as we look at the bird that was sitting on the other one, it's called an oxpecker. Susie R, you wanted to know what it was. It's called a red-billed oxpecker. 
and it's eating away at the ticks and other ectoparasites. But if we look at the zebra, I think he looks in pretty good condition. His mane is still standing up straight. That's always an indication with zebra if they're not feeling good. Their manes will lie down as the fat reserves get eaten up and then the mane falls down on the neck. He looks pretty fat. Zebra always look pretty fat. His hips don't seem to be showing, although there's a little indication that his hips are showing a bit, but I don't think he's in a bad way at all. So at the moment in the Sabi Sands, there's certainly no kind of um, great line of emaciated and dying animals. We're okay for now. Of course, we're only at the very, very beginning of the end of the rainy season. So the coming months will be telling. Okay, let's carry on, see what we can see around the next corner. As we were just discussing, Dave and I, you just never know what there might be around the next corner. I think this is a zebra stallion and his young sort of ascari. Hello, Sand Blaster. You're worried about the rhino in the drought, um, and especially given their sort of threatened status at the moment. Sand Blaster, I think you'll find that the rhino are not going to suffer any more than any of the other animals around here. You say you've read that they need water. Yes, they do, but so do the elephants, so do the buffalo, so do the impala, so do the zebra. And so in the Sabi Sands, for example, I think they'll be fine. You know, there's lots of water around. In the Kruger area, they may struggle a bit. They're not particularly good at migrating, and they're built to squat, so they're not built to move long, long distances, but I think they're gonna be affected far less than, say, the warthogs, which really don't have the ability to migrate very far at all, and so I think they'll be, I think they'll be okay. I mean, for now, I don't think they're gonna be any worse affected than any of the other animals, but time will tell. It's the grazing, really, that's going to be the limiting factor, I think. I don't believe that the water in the Sabi sands is ever going to be a limiting factor for these animals, unless the drought gets truly, truly severe. It's the grazing that's starting to run out, and that's going to affect animals, I think, more than the water at the moment. That's not the same, of course, further east of us, though, where there is much less artificial water. I'm afraid I'm beginning to wonder if shadow still exists at all. Perhaps, maybe, and I mean, I really haven't heard anything about this. Maybe she's cosseted herself away in Hoffman's to the south of us, where maybe she's got a little den. And perhaps there will be some little leopards fairly soon. That would be very exciting. Likewise, Karula's tracks I haven't seen for the last few days. That either means she's absconded or she's concentrating in an area. Look at that beautiful roller picture. Or oh, she's concentrating in an area where she's not being disturbed. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Oh, that for our new viewers. He's one of our most common birds, actually. And he's called the lilac-breasted roller. And unusually, for such a colorful bird, both male and female are exactly the same color. Isn't he magnificent? They tell me there are up to seven colors on a lilac-breasted roller. I'm going to leave you to try and count them. In fact, why don't you do that? Count the, quickly count the colors that you can see and tweet them through to us. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv or on YouTube chat. Seven colors, tell me what they are. I think I've tried to count them once. I'm not sure I ever got near seven. Take a screenshot, if you like. And then, while this bird, of course, is now looking on the ground for little insects and grasshoppers and things to try and eat, and already on the ground, Dave, is a red-billed hornbill. And the red-billed hornbill is digging in amongst the dung of impala, looking for termites probably that's eat, that are eating the dung and other insects. There will probably be some grubs buried under the ground here. I was reading about feeding in birds the other day, and although that 
beak looks like a sort of um, dead appendage. There are actually some very fine nerve endings on the end of it, and it's a tremendously complex organ. And a hornbill, if you watch it carefully, is able to stick, spike that beak down at a great speed and pick up individual ants. And the only way to do that, of course, is if it is tremendously sensitive. And the brain power and nervous control and feeling in that beak are quite astonishing. And if you doubt me, next time you go past a traffic cone, steal it, take it home with you, attach it to your face, and see how easy it is to maneuver your way around without bashing it on the wall or Now, Tom, you are keeping a bird list, which is wonderful stuff. You're on 99 birds, you say, and you say it would be nice to keep to get to 100 before you've been watching for two months. Well, I'm sure it would be, Tom. Um, we'll do our best to find you another one. I'm very sad we couldn't show you the mocking cliff chat that we had in camp today. That would be a really good one to show you, but I'm pretty sure it won't be on your list. Beautiful yellow red billed hornbill that. Okay, let's move on from here. Our next port of call will be Treehouse Waterhole, which is a little puddle at the moment, and I want to see if the water is still flowing under the surface there. Now, Miss Lynn, a very nice question about changing coats and colors with the seasons and there are no mammals that change their coats and colors Miss Lynn, but of course there are many birds that do they have what we call breeding plumage and it's very expensive to produce the pigments that make the colorful feathers that birds have and so a lot of them have evolved the ability especially those that are sexually dimorphic in other words that where the males are the colorful ones where they will lose that color going into the winter time when they're not breeding the yellow weavers are a very good example the southern masked weaver and the village weaver that we get here they will go very drab during the winter season and likewise um, a lot of the other little birds like the widers they'll lose their tails and go completely sort of dull brown like the females during the winter season um, but what is interesting there's a also a um, well there's a I don't know if there are any insects like this here but you get insects I know there's a very famous example of a British insect which will change color and it's an example of it's it's changed color in the population according to environmental conditions and this moth will be alternatively white or sooty, sooty black depending on how polluted the air is and it the individuals in the population don't change but what happens is that if if it's clear and there's no pollution in the area the moth will be a, a sort of dull white color and then if the pollution goes up what happens is that there's a selection pressure. So there's a pressure for dark, I mean, there are the genes for the dark moths exist in the population. And as the pollution gets worse, so the dull white ones will be eaten by predators and the darker ones will be, be allowed to expand because it's easier for them to hide from predators. Then when the pollution decreases again, the opposite occurs. The more obvious ones are the dark ones and they'll then get eaten up and the pale ones, their numbers increase the population. So, yep, lots of different changing things. I'm sure that you'll get similar kinds of things out here with some of the invertebrates. I don't know of any specifically, but those are the sorts of changing characteristics of the animals out here during the seasonal changes. Nice question, that one. Lots to talk about, something like that. Those are the best kind of questions, of course don't really have any definite answers. Now, the great rushing waters of a treehouse dam, as we approach, you can see not quite so rushing. But what I want to do is just have a look and see if that puddle that's in the middle of the water hole here is in fact still a puddle or if it has been reduced to nothing. 
go around onto the dam all day, and then we'll have a look. Okay, now, Deborah and the monkey, monkey man, you've come up with seven colors for the lilac breasted roller, white, black, lilac, blue, green, and I'm missing one, of course, orange, I think was the other one. Um, I'm not sure it's got green, or it might sort of say two shades of yellow, at least two shades of blue. Now, in that hole there, Dave, is probably a little puddle. And that's born of some subsurface water flow here that the elephants felt with their feet as they walked along here during the beginning of this drought, and they dug themselves a hole there. And I think there's probably a small puddle in there at the moment, but certainly not much. And I, there was always a little water warthog here or a couple of birds knocking about, but perhaps even that puddle is now dry. I was chatting briefly yesterday about the pigments that birds have and the fascinating story that they have black pigment and white pigment and orange and yellow and red. But that blue and the lilac that you see is a trick of the eyes. It's a trick of something called iridescence and a, what are those, the other one called? It's called, diff mm, I've forgotten the word. Anyway, basically what it means though is that various crystals of melanin and air pockets are arranged in certain ways along with those pigments in the feathers of those birds. And they're not actually, they're not actually pigments, which I think is fascinating. Okay, let's go back to the lions. They are apparently uh, still on the hunt for something. Now, I'm not feeling hugely optimistic about the situation here, but I thought I'd call you across just to give you an update. This individual has spotted some parlor. You can see she's very, very focused. The other four members of the Pride are completely oblivious to the Impala's presence. There we go. But there is a chance that she could cause them to change their, their mood. The problem is, is that there's a fairly large, relatively open gap between the lion and the Impala. And the Impala are currently about 100 meters away in that direction she's looking in. I don't think we can get you a visual of the Impala for a number of reasons. The bush is very thick, and we have got our antennas and all our equipment behind us. So we're just going to have to take our word for it. We thought we'd just give you a quick update. And it's interesting, you know, predators, even though they are opportunistic and they will take whatever opportunities they can get, not, you know, they, they can also work out reality and risk opposed to reward. Is it worth the effort and energy to try and catch these impala, which they know are difficult prey to catch? They're a far distance off. They may do the maths and think, oh, you know what? I don't think it's going to be worth our effort this time. And I'm guessing that's what's going to happen. I hope I'm wrong. Hello, Eric in New York. You would like to know the possible threats that lions will have in this specific area. Well, uh, with general, a general rule with lions across Africa, their own biggest enemy will usually be other lions. They will fight amongst one another for land. These ladies have to compete with other ladies or prides for territories. Oh, here we go, Vim. How awesome is this? Hello. Can you smell those impala? Are you going to show the other ladies exactly how to catch them? Please do. Well, 
That looks good. They have been holding their noses up, and the smell of impala has obviously been wafting very gently to, towards us. So let's reposition the vehicle and see what happens here. Sorry, Eric, as I was saying, that lions are going to be their own biggest uh, kind of competition and enemy as a general rule. But also possible prey that they may come across if they try and hunt buffalo. It's a very dangerous business. That's why you saw these ladies give way to the buffalo and not put up too much of a a fight there to the buffalo's resistance. I'm just going to stop in this little window here. We may just see a little bit more playful action. The one lady is relieving herself there, so it would be an inopportune moment for others. Well, I'm glad we stuck around. It looks like these two at least are showing some signs of movement. I'm going to keep going. So, Eric, uh, hunting dangerous animals like buffalo is obviously going to be another time that lions do come unstuck. L uh, hyena, another animal that will also be a possible threat to lion. In the Sabi Sands, I've found that, generally speaking, hyena do not cause any trouble with lion, but that is just a general rule, and it's not the case. There is a clan of hyena further to the west of where we are that is renowned for giving lion a hard time. Oh, this is going to be great. We're going to be able to show you the impala that's a busy alarm calling at the spot. Quickly. Oh, hold on, Liam. I'm going to turn it. Just to level off the camera quickly here. You can see it's looking straight at the lion. You'll hear it snorts. Very short, short, sharp nasal snort. trying to find a spot where we've got signal some view which I think will be somewhere just about now one lady quite close to us behind us to the right I think she's gonna be our best pet we can't show you the impala from where we are here but we're gonna be able to get some fantastic close-ups of this individual hello so, these two lioness couldn't resist the smell of impala that was wafting towards them, but like I said, it was just too open, too much ground to cover, and the impala with absolute ease managed to spot them. They've had no need to actually even run away the impala. They feel so confident that they are happy to stay right here, keep an eye on this threat, rather than fleeing into the unknown. I guess, relative to a common saying, better the devil you know than the one you don't. And that's exactly the theory of the Impala's applying. Oh, wow. Straight down those bone crunching jaws. That was a fantastic view. Hello to draw in Berlin and you are wondering if I ever have the urge to lean out as the lions walk just meters past our vehicle and try and touch them. Um, to be honest, I, I don't draw. I've never had a huge inclination to want to cuddle these animals um, or, or play with them. And I guess that's because I'm a firm believer that these animals belong in the wild and not to be in a scenario where we can pet them. I am get enough animal attention from animals that have been domesticated, and I'm content playing with dogs and domestic cats. 
But wild animals, no, I, I, I really don't. And I guess it's because I've got a probably sour taste in my mouth for the amount of people that do not realize the kind of negative negatives. And again, this is just my opinion of having wild animals in captivity. It is necessary up to a point. I'm not saying that that is not the case, but for humans to go and to be able to cuddle baby wild animals, for me, is merely a money-making racket. It has got nothing to do with the well-being of those animals. Again, don't be confused. I understand there are necessities for zoos. Again, even then, you get good zoos and bad zoos, but I do not mind a good zoo. We're not going to go into the finer details, but again, I do not feel that at any point in time it's a requirement for money to be made off the petting of animals, and that's what's I guess caused my brain to not think in that light. Here comes another lady. Hey, Walt R. Buck. Good to have you with us. And you would like to know, oh, another big yawn. Look at that. She's the lady with a broken canine. I think she's the oldest in the pride. Walter Buck, you would like to know a little bit more about the discussion we had last night regarding the front paws or the front hooves of actually any animals, front feet of any four-legged animals being bigger than the rear. And it's quite simple, the biggest, heaviest portion of the animal's body, a four-legged animal's body, is always at the front. That's where most of the organs are, the head, the shoulders, wow. And therefore, bigger support is needed. That's why they have the bigger feet in the front, and not the back. It would kind of be inverted. It would be, you'd be inside out if your back feet were bigger than your front feet for a four-legged animal. You would look very clumsy, I guess. It just makes more sense in terms of the anatomy and the job required of those paws. Oh, just meters past VM, too close to even full. What are your ladies' plans? Uh, is this the second wind? Are we going to get a little bit more action from you, or is this just merely uh, repositioning to keep the close bonds and cohesiveness of this pride intact. I'll see the two got up and moved, lured by the impala initially. Now the others maybe are feeling a little bit left out. The fifth and final member is making her way here. I just want to see if I can't roll forward a tiny bit to find a little gap of where this impala is. Can you see it through there, VM? Yeah, it is. Let me just keep moving forward. There it is. Oh. No, I overcooked it. Let's hope we still have signal in the next gap. You would have got a glimpse of the Impala who's still standing exactly where it was. Oh, there we go. Well done, Viem. That is a little tiny window of opportunity to keep an eye on what's going on there. And this is where the line are right here. And that, in terms of distance between the line and the Impala, is probably, I would say, 70, 80 meters. And it just goes to show that impala and a lot of prey animals will back themselves once they know that the predators are around, unless, of course, they are very, very close. And when I'm say very, very close, 20 or 30 meters, the impalas would probably not hang around. But again, just to further emphasize how quick the prey are and how well adapted they are at escaping, an animal that hunts on its own, like a leopard, would need to be five, maximum, 10 meters away before its prey, before it lunges. Otherwise, the prey is just simply too quick for it. 
obviously lion have got the benefits of being able to encompass their prey so if they do do a good job of encircling them or encompassing them one lion could charge out early just to kind of flush the prey towards the other pride members so they don't have to be as stealthy as leopard um, but still they they've got their work cut out for them these lion not an easy business to bring down their prey Let's see if we can't get into another spot. I don't want to go any further down this little dip because I fear we may lose signal. We're not going to run over a lion, are we, Vim? No. Okay. to Coldplay and very happy to have a famous band joining us on safari this morning I hope everything's going well and let us know when next year on tour in South Africa <laughs> um, Coldplay you would like to know why Junior the young male lion has left the pride and whether this is normal it's absolutely normal uh, if anything, it's, it's, it's imperative, it's important that young male lions that are born to any pride, as Junior was, move off and go and spread their seed elsewhere once they have passed the grueling gauntlets of being a young male lion trying to establish his own territory. It takes at least two or three years after a young male lion has generally left its pride at around two and a half to three years of age would be your average age that a young male would often be chased away by his fathers or by a new coalition of males that has come through in this case it was the latter as opposed to the fathers having to chase them away the fathers were chased away by a coalition before they even had time to chase away their son who was getting to that age he was showing sexual curiosity with his mothers and sisters which you don't want for inbreeding purposes so it's not uncommon cold play what was unfortunate for junior is that he was alone he was a single boy and unlike the birmingham boys who had brothers and cousins of similar ages that could they could all join up together and leave simultaneously and form a strong team of five males that's not always the case so you could say junior was unfortunate but according to the speculations that he is still alive and has been seen in the kruger park not too far from here i'm told he is with another young male um if i'm not mistaken so he could have already found another friend to join forces with and obviously even though it's just one male that he's joined up with it's better than being alone but he does have his odds cut out for him. Well, that's the way Mother Nature ensures that populations stay intact. Not every young male lion that reaches adulthood is destined to be a dominant male of an area. Only the strongest and in some cases luckiest males will get to be dominant. It's not like kind of the lives of humans. Well, I guess it can be related to the lives of humans. Not every human will be fortunate enough to get married and have kids although it's a lot easier for us to fulfill that role than it is i guess for lions living in the wild but that's merely because we don't have the same competition as we did when we were more wild animals than we are now but it's yeah it's not every other animal's privilege to be able to mate and be dominant it's the same for the herbivores as well as the predators Derek, are you interested to know who was the dominant coalition that reigned through this area before the Matimba coalition? And I am not too sure. I'm not too sure if the Mapojo coalition reigned this far north. I know they were a dominant coalition in the Sabi Sands, uh, but further south of here. 
before the, the Matimbas, or kind of the, there may have been a slight overlap. Um, the Majingi lions uh, were post Matimbas, and they've actually been seen chasing those two Matimba males around uh, on Londolozi, which is a property south of us. Um, it, it appears sadly like the Matimba's days are numbered. They've had an altercation, I'm told, with the Machapiri males, a coalition that we don't know, uh, as well as the Majingi lines. Again, a coalition that we don't know and see, but that occurred further south of us. Um, if anyone, and I'm sure someone will be able to furnish us with the information as to who was here before the Matimbas. I'm guessing though this was probably six or seven years ago. Um, the Matimbas reigned here for quite a long time and it's not uncommon for male lions to uh, dominate a, a certain area for up to six or seven years. They'll yeah. generally become dominant uh, over any given area from about five years of age to seven years of age, which is applicable in the case of the Birmingham boys. And you'll tend to find that they'll be strong enough to be able to generally maintain that uh, area for about five to seven years. Again, it, there's so many variables, but that's the general age at which they'll start, uh, their health will start degrading at around 12 years of age. Um, just like the Matima males, I think they're there and thereabouts. And now they're getting a little bit old, they've passed their cell by dates and slowly they are losing power and condition. Let's see if we can reposition and find out what this one lioness in front is doing. She appears to be on the move again. The Impala have finally moved off. So, so very fortunate this morning to see them as active as they have been. And it looks like we're going to get a few more little glimpses of movement. Hello, Georgie. You would like to know if we know if any of these lions are actually pregnant, as well as Virginia. And Georgie, we can't be certain, but there is a strong chance that some of them are pregnant. Um, they have been seen mating with the Birmingham males. And only time will tell. I can't be certain at this stage. During a coalition takeover, which has happened very recently, lioness will often come into what is called a false estrus, simply to give those males what they want, but it may not necessarily result in any cubs. So hard to be certain, but I would not be surprised if any of them are in fact pregnant. So any time in the next few months, after a three month gestation period, we may just get lucky. And isn't this great right in front of the vehicle? Okay, well, Derek Johnson, you are inquiring as to whether or not Amber Eyes is showing any signs of pregnancy. And I think this is the one over here. And no, her, her belly doesn't look to be sagging to me, if anything, quite the contrary. I love it when they scratch their claws like that. She's even chewing on a branch at the same time. She's brushing her teeth and having a manicure all at the same time. And Zumi, Mike, exactly. Just like domestic cats, uh, these lions will be shedding off little sheaths 
of their toenails, leaving fresh, sharp nails in their wake. And that is why they'll continually try and maintain their sharp claws for good reason. They use them to latch onto their fast-moving prey. Sadly, it appears like these ladies are doing two things which don't suit us. They are about to possibly cross over our northern boundary. Failing that, they're going into a dip where we may not have signal. Either way, it has been a fantastic, fantastic morning following them. There's still two more off to our right, one of which is on the move, and the other one is still lying down. Now, of course, and unless, of course, we are lucky and there's a breeding herd of buffalo somewhere nearby or some blind warthogs, I don't think we're going to be seeing too much action from these ladies, but who knows, maybe they can hear something or smell something that we are unaware of. Brian in Philadelphia, thank you so much for letting us know what happened a little bit earlier. You have had a long day at the office. It was 10.30 p.m. in Philadelphia uh, when you were planning on going to bed, but you thought you'd just check in on what's going on on Safari Live. And since then, a couple of hours later, you've had a few beers and a lot of action and entertainment. So apologies to keep you up. I do not want to be involved in your thought process when you have to wake up tomorrow morning, but I'm very happy that you did get to, get to catch up with the Inkahuma Pride and enjoy a few beverages whilst doing so. Jealous, actually. I wouldn't mind being in the same situation as you. Shane, this lady's got a bit of a limp. It's a front right paw has got something wrong with it. And Nemo, Diane, and Mary, you guys are all interested to know my thoughts on this paw. I can't see what's wrong with the front paw. Maybe it's just a little bit sprained, possibly. Um, her back right paw also has a very slight injury that we've been able to see. So that's got a visible wound on it, not at the moment. VM is trying to show you guys as much as possible of that front right, which is certainly being nursed. And the back right, so it's got a very kind of slight gash on in between the kind of middle toes, you could say. Just going to reposition quickly. I'm going to try and stay on some high ground and just get a long distance view down of them, work out what they're doing. Those stations in Kuhumas look like they're about to cross north into Buffalo, so Gauri cut line. Oh, there's a whole host of Impala further up ahead there. Right at the top of that next crest, VM. There's a whole bunch of Impala there. Uh, morning, Gauri cut line, Buffalo cut line. Okay, thank you very much. So who knows, maybe, just maybe we're in luck and maybe they're going to pursue this potential prey up ahead. It seems to be a large herd of impala up there. And maybe the action isn't over. Maybe I spoke too soon. And again, there's a strong chance that the lion knew about those impala long before they could see them due to their very strong sense of smell and hearing. Now that little dip where those lions are sleeping at the moment is a signal void for us. So I'm gonna stay perched up here with some long distance shots for the time being. If they do in fact decide to pursue those impala, then we'll be able to head through the dip and regain signal. But for now, I think these are going to be our best possible views. You see now, if I was in charge of this pride of lions, I would say, guys, what we're gonna do is, two of us are gonna go on the left, three of us are gonna go on the right, from right here, not stay in the road in the middle of open view to the Impala, which they're currently doing. And this again is just examples of how I feel that as wonderful as these predators are, they are not as tactically 
sound and strategic as people often give them credit for or make them out to be. This is a prime example. They know the prey is up ahead. They've seen them going both sides of the road. Why don't they just split up into a bullhorn formation? And from a long way out, try and encompass the prey and wreak havoc thereafter. At the moment, this one individual, and bless her for trying, is stalking up a barren open road. Wicked Blues Band, I'm glad that you have the same <laughs> train of thought as I do. And Wicked Blues Band is just relaying that he too or she too, I'm not sure whether you are male or female, Wicked Blues Band, difficult to tell with a name like that. I'm guessing that you'd be a male, but let us know. Mr. Wicked Blues Band or Mrs. Wicked Blues Band, whoever you may be. But yes, they are not displaying huge amounts of intellect and hunting prowess. All right, well, while we had a bit of a stalemate here with the Inkuhuma ladies, we're going to send you over to James to see what he's up to. Yeah, everyone, just to have a look at a dike here. You see it there, Dave? It's that antelope through there on this path. There's a little dike who thinks we can't see her. Now, the most interesting thing I've seen since we last saw you was a squirrel that had caught itself a scorpion. And I've never seen that before. It had bitten off the head and taken just the tail and the body. It seemed to be carrying it back to its little hole in the tree. Now, you do read that squirrels will eat that sort of thing. They will eat insects, absolutely. But I would have thought a scorpion was beyond the capabilities of a little rodent that is the squirrel. But seemingly, the burrowing scorpion that it found um, found out otherwise. Otherwise, we have failed to find any tracks of leopards, no elephants at this stage, but lots of little things we've seen. A couple of nyala, a couple of steenbok, a little steenbok lamb at one stage that ran off into the bushes. Not much that would stand still for us, unfortunately. And we're now making our way down through the central regions of Juma to see if we can't pick up Again, maybe tracks of Karula this time. Her daughter, Shadow, nowhere near here. Now, of course, the other day we found out, well, I, I mean, I should have known this, of course, but I pushed it from my mind, possibly for good reason. Um, Shadow is not only Karula's uh, daughter, but also her sister. They share a father. Of course, it's, um, well, it's difficult to come to terms with this human being. I'm just going to stop here. There's some bird activity, and I'm wondering if there are not a few alarm calls, David. Just have a look here. There's a spider. So, some magpie shrikes calling, and also a white barred scrub robin. Right, now what I'm going to do is point this thing out to you. And if those lions do do something extraordinary, um, I won't be able to hear about it, so you'll have to crash cut away, Kirsten. Dave, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. So here is the golden orb web spider, and very few of them around at this time of the year, well, normally lots of them, normally they're hanging from every branch, and that's because uh, there's rain around, and they like the rain, and they like the insects that, bring, that come with the rain. 
but at the moment, very few of them. Now, the reason I want to stop at this one specifically, if you look at my finger, David, coming down onto the web here, there is the male. You see him? So that's the male golden orb web spider. And I think, you no, know, he's still alive. And his consort is this much larger female here. There she is. I'm just touching her on the hand. See? And... James, the female again, please. The female again. There's the female. The big one. Right. Now, the female is obviously much more vast than the male, and that results in his being eaten, of course, once they have, uh, well, produced, done what they had to do. His function is over, and she will often eat him. And the other thing I wanted to show you here is this thing. It's a collection of exoskeletons of her ex-prey, and that, of course, is to try and stop the birds. We think, we think she collects it there. Because if a bird comes flying along here, it's not going to see the silk. And that's to try and stop them getting tangled up here, A, breaking up the web. I thought I heard some bushes cracking. But I don't think I did lots of bird activity at the moment. And the only other thing that is really interesting is how strong this is. This is the strongest natural substance known to man. It is stronger than steel of the same width. So you can see that in front of my face there. Well, I've just broken off a piece, that's okay. Let me just bring it across. There, can you see it at all, Dave? Sorry, no, John. It's so skinny. That substance strung between my hands is stronger than steel of the same tension. Now, they are trying to farm golden orbweb spiders in order to make them so that they can harvest that kind of um, amazingly strong substance or silk. Right, that is the golden orbweb spider. Not nearly as many of them as there would be at this time of year in a wet year. Of course, this is a great, of great distress to many safari goers, uh, because if you're not used to having a giant spider land in your face, it can be indeed very disconcerting. And many of the time that I've had a tracker sitting on the front of the vehicle in fits of hysteria, uh, while I have tried to calm down the guest in the back who has paid handsomely for the privilege of coming on safari and found herself with a face full of golden orb web spider or indeed his face full with a gold, golden orb web spider. Can be a very disconcerting experience, and they're, of course, totally harmless. Apparently can give a little bit of a bite if they are seriously distressed, but it's totally harmless. They mm, can try it. There's a squirrel in this, not this first tree, the next one along. Mm -hmm. You got it. moving away. No, he's gone. Sorry about that. I really threw Dave under the bus there, but very little has managed to sit still for us today. Anyway, it's all right. It means everything's health healthy and moving around. There, Dave? I don't. There's a bird in the tree here. Yes. It's a crested barbet. Beautiful colours. Now, Brent, you're a new viewer. And it's 1 a.m. in the morning where you are. You're watching a live safari. You're asking what you're doing with your life. A and how B, how we are doing this. The first question I cannot answer, Brent, other than to say you are clearly not wasting your time if you're watching us, and we're very grateful for your time. Um, other than that, the philosophical questions around what you're doing with your life, I'm probably unable to help you with at this stage. How we're doing this is a combination of extremely clever people, uh, none of whom, well, certainly I'm not one of them, but extremely clever people who have managed to deliver a system 
that broadcasts basically from the back of the vehicle out of a large aerial that you can't see to a repeater tower which is situated well there are two of them on the reserve at the moment that then sends a signal back to the final control where Kirsty and Nikki are plonking away doing their jobs talking to us and sending the signal out and that then goes to a satellite and that then goes to London and from London it goes to Salt Lake City if I'm not mistaken for our stream if you're watching on Wild Safari Live if you're on YouTube it then goes across to wherever YouTube has its giant servers and from there it reaches you at 1 a.m. wherever you are in the world live and that's basically how it works it's like, a, it's like a mobile sports cast if you like a very mobile sports cast that's the call and you can hear why it's called the alarm call bird. David, I just had a wonderful idea for you. You should, you should employ one of these birds. You know that. You should perhaps capture one, put it in your room, so that it might, at 0400, make a very loud noise in your ear. David struggles at the morning sometimes, everyone. Yeah, interesting one, yes. Now, Donna, you heard, you want to know how David is adapting out here, and you heard that he ate a fly the other day on drive. I think the fly is the least of his worries at the moment. At the moment, Donna, he seems to be suffering from um, what many might call an advanced case of narcolepsy, which basically means that he cannot get his butt out of bed in the morning. And um, oft times do we hear his alarm call singing gently to him. He's obviously he's from Cape Town, you see, so he's got a very... Oh, you're from Johannesburg. From Johannesburg. Hey, have you spent time in Cape Town? Uh, yeah, you see, it's softened him up a bit. <laughs> and what happens is that his alarm plays him a very gentle song in the morning. It doesn't uh, make a very loud noise like the crested barbet. And so he just sleeps through it sort of thing and then we all get on the vehicles and everyone has forgotten about him because he's quite a quiet fellow he doesn't sort of throw his weight around the camp and so we don't notice until we're trying to take safari and then we hear the gentle snoring and the gentle singing of his alarm call and then we have to wake him up so the mornings he is struggling with otherwise i think he's adapting pretty well to the bush david uh, do you have an opinion on this look um adapting fairly well otherwise i would say Yes, he says he's very happy to be here. Um, I'm sure he is. If I had that much sleep, I'd also be extremely ecstatic. I'd be in a good mood permanently. <laughs> All right, back to the lions with Scott. I think they're probably about to leave the reserve. Well, there's not much to see here, but we would just call, thought we'd call you back to show you the only view we can get of them from a point of signal. Why don't you come with us? It's been such a great morning and we've had such great views of them. I don't think we need to see too much more of them. Of course, we would like to, but we don't need to panic if we can't. But let's try and go as far down into this dip as we can. As soon as we lose signal, um, I guess that may be a good time for you to go back to James. But we'll try and get you one last bit of view, but I fear that as soon as we go much further down here, we are going to start crackling up. At least our picture is. Oh, it must be starting to get a bit shaky. Maybe not. Maybe it is. Oh, we're lucky so far. Oh, will we be in luck? What will happen? View from there, Vian. Do that gap. Oh, well, I think that's as good as it's going to get. You can see a little ears poking up. It's been a wonderful morning. You can say your goodbyes to these ladies um, for the Sunrise Safari, but hopefully they are going to be around and they're not going to disappear over our northern boundary on the Sunset Safari. Vian and I are going to start heading back towards camp, and who knows what we may find on the way, but for now, over to James. Now, we are heading sort of down what we call Central Road, looking for tracks of a female leopard, a.k.a. Karula. 
Oh, I just want to say something here. This is very important. I'm going to stop the car and say this. Now, many of you are going to be upset by what I'm going to say. I don't think uh, you should lose any sleep over it. But Karula, of course, is known as the peaceful one. And Karula, K-A-R-U-L-A, -A, is in fact not a word. And I didn't think it was a word. And uh, when I arrived here, I knew a chap called Peace, and his Shanga name was Kurula. It's K-U-R-U-L-A. K-U-R-U-L-A, Kurula. Yes, that's what it is. And I checked this again yesterday because I was becoming more and more upset about it. Karula is not a word. Kurula is the Shangan word for peace. Right. So, yes. And so just bear that in mind. And unfortunately, there are lots and lots of words out here that because they sound quite nice in Shangan, very often, no one has taken the time to find out exactly how they're spelt or how they're meant. Now, that's not, of course, what happened with Karula. I think it's just because that's how we say it, Karula. We don't kind of, um, the A and the U are almost interchangeable in the language. But I've come across so many examples of a, for example, there's a drainage line down further south of here called the Tuguan. Now, the Tuguan is not actually a word either. It comes from the word iteguane, which means hamarko. But because of the way, I don't know, I guess people just, you know, the way we speak foreign languages, we don't generally pay, pay perhaps close enough attention. Um, it became the tuguan, which is totally meaningless. Of course, I wonder how many things around the world are named because of the way we've misheard the, um, unfamiliar languages, unfamiliar tongues. So if you don't mind, I'm going to keep calling Kurula Kurula, meaning the peaceful one, and those who wish to call Keeling, keep calling her Karula, well, that's absolutely fine. I don't think she minds one jot. This is where she had her original den, and there's definitely nothing else there now. So, I'm not sure. I'm still hopeful that she's got a cub or two, especially given that she was heading to and around before so three or four days in a row that we saw her. Then she'd come back to the pan, have a drink, and go away again. Of course, she did. She was brought out of hiding by Tundi's incursion and mating with Tingana the other day. Other than that, she's been fairly thin on the ground, which is not a bad thing. It's a buffalo dung through here, and there, of course, used to be a pan system, and we're going to rattle on and prattle on about the drought for uh, ad nauseum for the next little while. And if we drive through here, this is the kind of place where, in summer, natural water gathers. So there's a dry stream running through here, and in days, in years of flood, of course, that will flow very briefly. But along the banks, you have these pans. And in the pans, there's a lot of clay, and the clay, of course, will hold water. So you get these wallows where water would normally stand at this time of the year. And so you wouldn't need any artificial water in a year of normal rainfall because there would be standing water just in all these little pans. You often find a buffalo here or a little sound of warthogs, perhaps an elephant bull throwing mud on himself on a hot day. But now they're all dry. And it's simply because the rain has not come to fool them. There's a very really nice question here from Tony about the distances that we cover. Tony, you want to know how many on average we drive? It's so variable that an average is almost a meaning, meaningless kind of a, a statistic for the distances that we drive. So I've driven a great distance today, and that's simply because I haven't found anything of great note, and so we've just kept going and going. You'll probably find that I've driven in miles about, oof, what, 20 kilometers or so, probably about 16 miles, 12 miles, 12 or 13 miles or so today, and maybe a bit more, maybe up to 15. 
and Scott, I think you would have found, would have driven distance-wise less than half of that. And that's just because he's obviously been following those lines for the course of the morning. And very nice. Now, Maggie, M, you're in Australia and you've heard that the word for leopard in Shangan is yingwe with a Y. Y-I-N-G. Y-I-N-G-W-E and not Ingwe, I-N-G-W-E. You'll probably find actually in Shangan that the word is neither. It's probably N-G-W-E, Ingwe. And if you say there is a leopard, you'll say Ingwe. There it is, Ingwe. And that's why I think people think that it is called, sorry, there's a little nest above us here. I don't think there's anything in it, right above your head there, Dave. But there are lots and lots of mispronounced words, and it is actually a real bugbear of mine, especially in an area like this where we're surrounded by Shangan people, and there's no excuse for people not knowing the local word. And in fact, in, you know, from, from Australia or wherever you are in the world, doesn't, of course you're not surrounded by it, but I think it's just disrespectful to be in a local area like this and mispronounce words. Okay. We're going to hand you back to Scott now to close the show because it has been the Scott Dyson and Inkahuma show today. Wonderful stuff. So often we have lions doing nothing. And today they put on a marvellous show. So big thanks to all of you for uh, the brief time I've spent with you. It's been wonderful chatting. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for getting out of bed today. It was much, much appreciated. But it would be difficult for me to go out on my own and film myself. And big thanks to Kirsty and Nikki and the final control. We'll hand you back to Scott and the Inkahumas, and I will catch up with you this afternoon. Bye-bye. What a fabulous morning it's been, and I'm glad you've got to spend some time <clears throat> with James. Towards the end of it, the Lions were just too much action this morning to get James much time to entertain you guys, but what a wonderful way to explore Africa. Two vehicles on a live safari, and of course, we are so, so grateful for all of your contributions, comments, and support. And I think a morning like this is almost one to repay you, like I say, for all of your consistent support during the less action-packed drives. And no different to being on a regular safari. Not every drive is full of action, and I've really enjoyed sharing these moments and memories and experiences with you today. These moments and me memories will last us a lifetime. Well, they certainly will last me a lifetime. We've got some incredible views of the Inkahuma Pride, and it's just so wonderful to have them spending more and more time on our property and that our luck viewing them has been so, so good in the last couple of weeks. And Sandblaster, you've also put forward your thoughts saying it is just incredible the last few days, the views and insight that we have been getting into their lives. You wouldn't believe it, but I've just heard a squirrel alarm calling. Let's see if we can find it in the last minute or so of drive. Oh, here's one here running off. This one's interesting. I recognize nice this one because it's missing a lot of fur on its tail it's just got this big kind of tuft towards the end and it doesn't know what to do there's a dwarf mongoose poking its head out to the right here vm check this out <laughs> awesome the squirrel's alarming a little bit further ahead though this one wasn't the one that's alarming we are just going to slightly extend the safari until we find out exactly what it is. Who knows, maybe it's a leopard, but I'm guessing it's a bird of prey. Possibly a snake. You may wonder what that big balloon is over there. Um, it's part of our tech team's experiments. 
the squirrels are still up ahead, trying to pinpoint where they are. It's difficult having one ear blocked with an earpiece to work out where exactly sound is coming from can be tricky. I'm hoping we're gonna find you guys a snake, but it's possibly just a bird of prey. Where on earth are you? Oh, there's two that are alarming, which is what's making our lives difficult. And the fact that there are alarm calling over wide distances mean I'm guessing they can all see the same predator from a distance, which means I'm guessing that it's a bird of prey. I, I'm not feeling confident that we are, in fact, going to find it. So, um... I think we will... No, I can't, I can't leave you guys hanging. Let's, let's finish this till the end. Let's find out where the squirrel is and at least get you a visual of an alarm calling. While we do that, I'd like to apologize to all of you who are missing the Juma Watsall camera, which is a live feed, and we're having some tech difficulties with that, but the team is aware of it and doing everything they can to try and fix it. And I'm told I think there is an official update on the Facebook. There we go. There's a squirrel on this fallen down tree. Oh, it's just run off. There it goes. <laughs> that's not the one that's alarming, though. That's another one. The one that's alarming still up ahead. Maybe they've spotted Karula. Squirrel hunt. At least we've seen two, not the two we are. Okay, I now know which tree I think the squirrel is in. We're getting slowly closer to solving the mystery of these alarm calls. <laughs> Taking me on a wild chase all over. the general area. I thought the squirrel was coming along, calling from somewhere in this apple leaf tree. Uh, this is just, this is just flabbergasting me. Ellen Fowler, you would like to know which leopard did Brent see earlier? Let me get a